In a wall that has such important boundaries as the Great Wall of China, Hadrian's Wall, and that boundary stone a Belgian farmer moved, Offa's Dyke can certainly claim to exist. Now, now, that's a bit harsh. Only parts of it still exist. But what it lacks in terms of intricate stonework, or inspiring grandeur, or easy-to-move stones, it makes up for in big piles of mud that go on for bloody miles. And mystery. Big piles of muddy mystery. When I was just a little scoff, we were taught that the dyke was a great big wall built by King Arthur that ran the length of the Wales-England border, to keep us noble wealth from sallying forth and reclaiming our lands from those dastardly English. My memory may have embellished that somewhat. But how much of that is true? It turns out, little to none of it. Offa's Dyke is a big pile of earth and stones that runs through the border areas of Wales and England, still standing in many places today, over 1,000 years later. You know that really impressive sandcastle you built down the beach when you were a kid? Yeah, like that, but much bigger, much more youthful, and impressive to more than just your mum. Whilst it does vary in how it stands in places, the gist of it is basically a three metre ditch on the western side. For the Americans watching this, in your measurements that's about three and a half bald eagles that rises up steeply into a crest before a more gradual degress to the east, the English side. If that doesn't sound impressive, imagine trying to charge an army up three and a half bald eagles of steep hill, whilst the people above you fire and whack sharp pointy things at you. You'd be a kebab before you got to the top. Actually, you wouldn't, because you'd have probably had a heart attack after climbing one bald eagle's worth of hill. But a reasonably fit person would be a kebab. Defib pads only work for people that have liked this video, so you better get around to doing that. The Bishop Asser wrote that Offa's Dyke ran from sea to sea. You can't trust the church as far as we could throw you after you've had your bald eagle-induced heart attack. It doesn't run from sea to sea, nor was it continuous. So my teacher's got the run in the length of the board a bit wrong. Offa can't sue the USA for its sea to shine and sea tagline just yet. But King Offa did have another trait that the USA borrowed. He fancied manifest in his destiny west. In fact, he did try running a number of campaigns into Wales. None really amounted to much, though he did gain some ground to the west so the dyke was never really a border, making my teachers wrong on that aspect as well. Was it used to stop the noble wealth from claiming their lands back from those dastardly English? Also a big fat red cross on my teacher's homework there, and a note saying to see me after class, because they really screwed up the Welsh-English part. Let's set the scene. Wales wasn't Wales yet, it was numerous kingdoms made up of the original British peoples, who had been pushed further and further westward by the various interloping tribes of Angles and Saxons. Another theory on that in a moment who had invited themselves over for dinner and a quick game of stealing the country, a game they were to export around the globe in later centuries. England was also not yet England, and instead was multiple kingdoms who were made up of those tribes. This had been a time that anyone with a boat and a sword could pop over to England and declare themselves a king. To be fair, that's a traditional history as told from sources such as Beedy, writing in the 8th century, and one my teachers taught in school. More recently, a large number of historians have made a very compelling case that there was never much of an invasion and only a very small-scale movement of peoples, that it was more of a cultural exchange. Those that we think of as Angles and Saxons were mostly still the original British who, for one reason or another, had decided their history involved them invading their own country and beating themselves. I tend to think of the twinning of one town in a country to one in another as being entirely pointless and done just for local politicians to go on a free holiday. But this is one of the few times in history that such cultural exchange ended with a country conquering themselves, retroactively. But that doesn't let me insult the English for being conquered by anyone with access to a dinghy. Though I do get to point out they just wished their way into becoming immigrants. Take that, Nigel Farage. Either way, they both identified as being Angles, Saxons or Jutes, Offa's mercy and saw themselves as Angles, whilst all the tribes were just Saxons to the Welsh kingdoms, and it made little difference as to the building of the dyke. If you do want to know more, Guthlack has a fantastic video on it, link in the video description below. So it was neither Wales nor England, and the Mercians under King Offa weren't even the Angles they claimed to be. They had just as much of a claim to the British land as a wonderful Welsh. I should probably stop my bias now. So that's a no for that part by my teachers. For defence... They get a half mark there, but only because I'm in a generous mood. The dike is carefully placed, often allowing great vantage points to look west from, and defensible positions, but it doesn't always take advantage of obvious places that would help defence, which suggests that defence wasn't its sole purpose. Presumably because when the Welsh flew on their dragons, which are historically accurate, I swear, land-based defences would have been useless. But the ditches were very good for stopping horses and other animals, and did make attacking up them a whole lot more difficult. Having the high ground is useful to more than just shouty Jedi Knights. 
But what the position of the dike does do, mostly, is provide an impressive looking monument when viewed from the west, essentially showing the proto-Welsh the power that the Mercians could bring to bear. I haven't found any sources suggesting that offer was overcompensating for <clears throat> smaller things, but I bet good money on it. But what it did do was provide a Gandalf moment. You shall not pass. Essentially a defensible line in the sand, well, earth, that could ensure that the Welsh could go here and no further, unless they were on their dragons. We have one final bit that my teachers claim, that it was built by King Offa. Unfortunately, much like you when you went to your school dance, we don't have a date. So we can't definitively date the whole thing as being attributed to Offa. The first reference we have to him building it is in the late 9th century, a hundred years after his reign. Many studies trying to date it have been inconclusive, with claims ranging from parts of it being built during Roman times to it happening post Offa's death. There's even a claim of aliens doing it. Actually, I have no idea if anyone has claimed that, because I don't want my Google searches being polluted with alien done it conspiracy theories. But people are idiots, so it's probably a safe bet. What we do have suggests that some of it, if not all of it, would have been built around the time of Offa. So that's a roughly 20% mark for my teachers. My turn to give them detention, I think. So, what was it used for? Well, aside from the defensive benefits I mentioned, Offa's Dyke showed the power that King Offa was able to wield. One estimate I read suggested it would have taken 10,000 men working over four seasons, so probably about four years, to be able to build it. That's a massive manpower when, by the year 1000, a hundred years later, England only had a population of a little over one million people. For a king to bring that many people out to make such a huge structure shows his power, wealth and willingness to overcompensate. This would have been seen by the other kings in England when they weren't too busy playing pretend Angles and Saxons anyway, and it showed they feared what he was capable of. They didn't want him to start digging their graves. Those pesky, sorry, I mean valiant Welsh weren't quite as noble as I'm making them seem. Not only would they have brought war with the Saxon tribes enough times as to be a threat, they also had something of a habit of cattle rustling. Unfortunately, that isn't running up to a cow and scruffing up its hair, but the pinching of the cattle and taking them back home. For a population that made a significant proportion of its GDP through farming, that is a problem. With a massive dike stopping animals at all but designated and guarded access points, then that became a whole lot more difficult. So the Mercian farmers to the east of the dike would have been well protected, safely behind their pile of mud. It also ensured that these checkpoints could be used for taxation and tribute collecting for anyone using them. It seems that toll roads between Wales and England existed before the Severn Bridge was even a thing, only this time you would have had to pay to enter England rather than Wales, and who, in their right mind, would choose to do that? Yes, I know I'm a Welshman living in England, but all that proves is I'm not in my right mind. Look, for all I joked about it being unimpressive, in reality you're talking about a man-made barrier that ran near enough the length of Wales, with only breaks for large rivers and a few other gaps. That is massively impressive for an 8th century overcompensation of King Offa's manhood. Remember, the Great Wall of China is actually a lot of different walls, all built during different time periods. Presumably, they didn't have to overcompensate quite so much. It also showed skill in keeping its alignment, constant-ish design, its careful planning and its multitude of uses. It even changed the course of small rivers. So, to sum up, what we know of Offa's Dyke is that it may or may not have been built at the time of King Offa, it may or may not have been used much for defence, it may have been a tool to project power, it may have been a tool for controlling people, it may or may not have run from sea to sea, it may have been a tool for collecting taxes, it may have been built by some Britons deluding themselves into thinking they were Germanic, and that it may have been the first structure to be measured in bald eagles. One thing we can say for certain is it wasn't much of a defence against dragons. As I said at the start, it's still a big, muddy mystery. If you're new here, subscribe to Be Insulted By Me on a semi-regular basis. Actually, if you're not new here, subscribe as well, because apparently most of you buggers aren't yet subscribed. I never know how to end these videos, so how about I'll see you on the next one. Oh, hang on. That's how kings and generals do it. Balls. I'll have a better ending on the next one. In the meantime, sod off, will you?